is a junior faculty in the Women's Cancer Research Center. Normally also would be running one of these sites, um, the, the WCRC site of the, of the uh, Hillman Academy, uh, but this year still gonna give us a talk on breast cancer. Um, and I know a lot of you are working on breast cancer, so that's fantastic. And uh, Amanda and Nilgen, have you guys met at all? Uh, I, I recognized Nilgen from uh, one of the lab meetings. Yeah. Oh. We didn't talk. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, Amanda is uh, working with Steffi and Vasiri um, this summer and again. Oh, cool. Yeah, I guess it was virtual, so. I like if it was in person, I would definitely remember. It, <laughs> <laughs> it makes it tough, but I'll let Nilgen give her talk. Uh, feel free, as always, ask questions anytime you want. I will, Nilgen, I'll monitor the chat for you in case anyone asks okay. questions that way. That's how um, students have typically been doing it. Um, but again, you guys feel free to unmute and just ask questions as you have them too. Yeah, sure, sounds good. And I'm assuming you guys can see my screen. Yes. So yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. This is usually a lot more interactive and a lot more fun in person. And I try to like ask a lot of questions and it's just based on my teaching of other classes. <laughs> I think that hasn't worked too well online. And then I just like, there's that dead silence where nobody says anything. So uh, I would appreciate it if you guys have anything like to add as I go along. But like this year, I think it's gonna be like more in a, like a lecture format. But uh, do please interrupt if there's anything that is not clear or if you have any questions. So yeah, let's learn a little bit about breast cancer. All right. <clears throat> so let's start with some facts and statistics about breast cancer. And I think, you know, looking at it this way, it's shocking that, you know, one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer sometime during their lifetime. And I think it's even more striking when we put it into the statistics that, you know, every three minutes, a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, which also translates to one woman dying from breast cancer every 13 minutes. So I looked up the estimated cancer statistics for 2020, and uh, it is estimated that among U.S. women, there will be over 270,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer and over 42,000 breast cancer deaths in 2020. And I just want to point out that <clears throat> even though breast cancer is very uh, prevalent in women, we also know that men also get breast cancer at much lower uh, incidence rates. And uh, so this makes breast cancer second only to lung cancer in cancer-related deaths among women. So what is breast cancer? I'm sure you guys have had some basic lecture on what cancer is. So uh, here is a depiction of the breast uh, here with the nipple and then here with the ductal structures. And then at the end of these ducts, there's these structures called lobules, which are involved in milk production and depicted here are also some neighboring lymph nodes close to uh, the breast tissue. So we know that cancer is un uncontrolled proliferation of cells and not surprisingly, breast cancer is uncontrolled proliferation of breast cancer cells. So there are two major uh, kind of concepts in understanding breast cancer. One is the non-invasive form of breast cancer. So we call this ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS for short. So in situ is a Latin term that means in place. And it indicates abnormal cells which are growing inside the milk ducts. But at this point, the cancer is quite retained. It has not yet spread to nearby tissues or lymph nodes. So this is considered to be like an early stage of cancer. Uh, sometimes these early lesions will go on to progress to invasive breast cancer. So these will be, again, abnormal cells, but now these are a lot more aggressive where they're breaking out of the ducts and into nearby uh, breast tissue, and they may even invade these lymph node tissues and then make their way either through the bloodstream or through these lymphatics to other sites. So this is called metastasis, the spread of breast cancer cells to other parts of the body. And when breast cancer has reached this stage, we call it metastatic breast cancer. So if we look at invasive breast carcinoma, there's actually a number of different histological subtypes, but the two major subtypes are depicted here. So one is invasive ductal carcinoma, IDC, and the other is invasive lobular carcinoma, ILC. So IDC is the major subtype of breast cancer, which accounts for 80 to 90% of all cases. And uh, we know that its incidence over the last couple of decades has been uh, constant. 
So IDC forms these round masses or lumps. Here is a picture, like a histological picture of IDC, where you can see that the cells are quite densely and closely packed together. While this growth pattern makes detection of IDC much easier by traditional assays such as mammography. And about 60 to 70% of all IDCs express the estrogen receptor, which we will talk about in a little bit. So ILC compared to IDC, it only affects 10 to 15% of the population. However, since breast cancer is so prevalent, this makes up about 24 to 30,000 cases annually. And if we were to treat ILC as its own, made, as its own subtype, this would make uh, ILC the sixth most common cancer in women. And we know that over the last couple of decades, its increase has uh, its incidence has been increasing. So you can see from this histological image that ILC is, you know, a little bit different than IDC in terms of how the cells grow. So they grow as kind of these like discohesive linear cords, and uh, this growth pattern is associated with the genetic, uh, you know, events that are specific to ILC. But they also make detection of ILC very difficult. Uh, they don't usually show up well in a mammogram and other techniques such as uh, you know CTs and MRIs might be required. Also, by the time this tumor is diagnosed, usually it's at a much later stage compared to IDC because of these inherent difficulties in its detection. So ER, uh, as I mentioned, there is some genetic uh, events that are specific to ILC, which is like loss of this adherence junction protein eketerin, but also most ILCs are positive for the estrogen receptor, uh, progesterone receptor, the other hormone receptor. They're negative for this growth factor receptor called HER2, and they are quite low proliferating, uh, which is you know, indicated by this KR67 uh, negativity or low KR67. And uh, you know, over, ER, uh, over 80 to 90% of ILCs express the estrogen receptor. However, for reasons that we're still trying to understand, they actually have poor response to endocrine therapy. And ILC happens to be the subtype of breast cancer that I work on. So if there's any questions uh, at the end or at some point about you know, ILC, if you're curious about it, I'm happy to answer any questions about that. So let's look at some risk factors for developing breast cancer. So we can divide these into factors that we can control versus factors that we cannot control. So for the factors that are you know, within our control, we can say body weight and weight gain, uh, diet, alcohol consumption, how much we exercise, stress and anxiety, as well as this hormone replacement therapy that is usually offered to uh, postmenopausal patients happens to also uh, you know, be a risk factor for breast cancer. And then there are also these factors that we, we cannot control, including age, gender, family history of breast cancer, uh, the exposure to estrogens, and this is indicated by early menarche and late menopause, as well as environmental estrogens. You might have heard of these uh, estrogen mimics, such as BPAs from plastics, that are also associated with uh, you know, elevated risk for, for breast cancer. Also, there are a number of inherited gene mutations. You've probably heard of these uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations, which happen to be these inherited mutations in these DNA repair pathways that also can predispose people to uh, uh, developing breast cancer. So a couple of questions that we will try to answer today regarding estrogen and breast cancer. So we'll talk about what is estrogen, what does it normally do in the body, and how does it do its job at the cellular level? In the context of breast tumor growth, how does it work? How does it fuel breast tumor growth? And how can we capitalize on this knowledge in order to treat breast cancers that are dependent on estrogen? And uh, you know some of these therapies work really well. I will cover those, but you know in some patients, uh, inevitably, clinically, we see uh, resistance to these therapies. And what can we do to combat those? So I'll talk about kind of hormones and estrogen and estrogen receptor. And uh, you can interrupt me if there's any questions. You know while we try to understand those concepts. So estrogen is a hormone, and typically at this point, I ask the class, you know, what a hormone is. I'm just going to go ahead and answer it. A hormone is a chemical messenger that is released into the bloodstream, and it acts either locally or distally at target organs. So there are a number of different uh, classes of hormones in the body. One class is called steroid hormones. These are derived from cholesterol, and they include estrogens and androgens. So estrogens are shown here, 
there's a couple different forms of estrogens and depending on their chemical structures, they're named differently. The most um, kind of potent form of estrogen in the body is called estradiol, but there's these other less potent forms called estron and estriol. And this isn't very important, but just for your curiosity, uh, these are named dependent on how many hydroxyl groups that they possess. Uh, diol, you know, having two hydroxyl groups, the estrone has one, but estriol, you know, it has three. So those are the steroid hormones, but there's additional hormones in the body, such as amine hormones. These are derived from tyrosine. There are peptide hormones, which are protein-based, and a good example of those is, uh, you know, insulin for blood sugar regulation. So how is estrogen synthesized in the body? I mentioned that estrogens are coming from, um, they are steroid hormones that are coming from cholesterol. So these include the female hormones estrogen and the, uh, the male hormone androgen. So these are all coming from the uh, molecule cholesterol and which we intake in our you know, dietary intake and uh, you know, which can be stored in liver and other organs. So typically cholesterol will be process to DHEA in the, andro in the adrenal glands, which is an androgen precursor. The next step is for DHEA to be converted to testosterone, which is an androgen. So this ho happens in both ovaries and testes. However, in the case of females in the ovaries, testosterone will be further broken down into estriol, the female uh, hormone. So this is just another picture of that, cholesterol going into DHEA, then testosterone, and then testosterone into estradiol. And there's an enzyme that is very critical for this process, whereby testosterone is converted into estriol, and that is called aromatase. And uh, I will tell you a little bit more about that because it's a very good therapeutic target for, for breast cancer. So what are the normal physiological effects of estrogen on the body? So this is a hormone that travels throughout the bloodstream to many different sites. And what does it do there? So in the breast, it you know, grows and shapes the breast. It prepares, uh, you know, the pregnant female for, uh, for breast uh, feeding. And in the brain, it helps adjust uh, body temperature. You know, it's good for the health of the skin, in the bone, you know, in the heart, liver, ovary, you know, you name it, it has very beneficial effects. So this is uh, why when uh, women typically after the age of uh, 50, they hit menopause, whereby they have no longer, um, you know, uh, estrogen synthesis in the body, they encounter a number of problems associated with these different tissues. So, you know, skin problems, osteoporosis, atherosclerosis, you know, sexual dysfunction. So uh, this is why some, you know, women actually go ahead and get uh, hormone replacement therapy, which used to be a lot more common in the past, but since it's uh, kind of recent indication with increasing risk of breast cancer, this is actually a lot less uh, these days than how much it used to be in terms of, you know, the dose that is given to patients. So we talked about estrogen and, you know, estrogen is this hormone, but it's not always secreted at normal levels. In fact, it's a very dynamically regulated uh, hormone. So over the course of the month, estrogen levels really uh, vary and they can go up, you know, and then uh, they'll go down and then, uh, you know, they will vary with, like they will go down with the menstrual cycle, as you can see here. In addition to that, they will also vary during pregnancy. At the beginning of pregnancy, estrogen levels are uh, low and then progressively they increase over time. And then with, uh, you know, delivery of, of the baby, they will dramatically go down. So this process is very important for um, kind of controlling how the breast tissue develops to the needs of the body. At the pre-pubertal stage, we start out with a rudimentary ductal system. Once we, you know, hit puberty with, uh, you know, hormonal changes, including, uh, you know, production of, of estrogen. Now we start getting this, uh, you know, uh, ductal elongation, bifurcation, and then with the estrus cycle every month, you know, there's additional side branching, kind of preparing the body for a potential pregnancy. And then if that doesn't happen, the breast kind of goes through the reverse of this process where, you know, the cells will go uh, undergo apoptosis to bring it back to the normal uh, structure. But if there is a pregnancy, uh, with this elevated estrogen levels, there will be further uh, differentiation into these uh, alveolar cell types that will eventually be producing milk uh, for feeding the offspring. Uh, 
So uh, we talked a lot about the estrogen, but for the estrogen to do its functions in the body, it needs a receptor called the estrogen receptor. So this is just to show you how in the cells, hormones and their hormone receptors work. So here is supposed to be the plasma membrane over here. And these are like these slides are courtesy of my pharmacologist colleague, uh, Matthew Sikora. And uh, here is the nuclear membrane and there's the DNA and here is the cytoplasm. So I talked about a couple of different kinds of hormones. So in the case of epinephrine, um, there's the adren uh, adrenergic receptors. So it can bind, this small molecule can bind this receptor and uh, downstream it can trigger activation of kinases. Very similarly, insulin is another hormone that I mentioned and at the plasma membrane, we also have the insulin receptor and insulin can go and bind its receptor at the membrane and then downstream, uh, you know, they trigger activation of kinases that will go on to do other events. In the case of estrogen, it's a little bit different. You know, in the very classical model, it's believed that estrogen can, you know, diffuse through the plasma membrane and then it can bind its receptor, uh, the estrogen receptor in the cytoplasm and together they can go and translocate into the nucleus to turn on ER target genes. And I said, this is the classical model. And I know that there are some additional models that actually say that estrogen can go all the way into the nucleus and that is where it's binding the estrogen receptor. But that's kind of like a small detail, but the net effect is estrogen binding its receptor, the two of them binding to specific sites on the DNA and activating target genes downstream of that. And that's exactly what I said. You have a ligand, a receptor, and then they will bind and activate. And I think something important to recognize is that the specific genes that are being turned on by the estrogen-estrogen receptor complex, they are specific to the target tissue, meaning in breast, you may have one set of genes turned on versus in the ovary and bone, another set of genes. And that will become important. I will mention uh, you know, a little bit later. So that's all about hormone action and how you know the, the hormone binds its receptor. And I just want to give you some background on how this knowledge came about. So early translational studies actually indicated that the ovaries are important in breast cancer. And this was initiated by a doctor. And if you look at this document, it's like from late 1800s. You know, George Beetson was one of the first people to recognize when he was studying lactation in sheep and cows, that there is quite a bit of similarity between the development of the normal breast and breast cancer. And uh, in fact, in 1895, he did this experimental treatment by removing the ovaries and the fallopian tube from a 33 year old woman with recurrent breast cancer. And remarkably, the tumors vanished within three to four months. And he treated additional women, one of who uh, similarly responded. So this was one of the first studies indicating that you know, whatever is in the ovaries is important for the growth of the tumor. And if one were to remove the source of whatever compound there is, you know, I'm just like imagining ourselves back in, uh, you know, late 1800s where we don't know estrogen, you know, all he knew that if he took the ovaries away, that in some cases, the, the breast tumor uh, shrank and the metastases in this case as well. So just a quick, you know, uh, recap of how our subsequent knowledge um, kind of came about. So in the 1900s, they showed that oophrectomy, which is the medical term for removal of the, of the ovaries, they showed that oophrectomy uh, was effective in treating metastatic breast cancer. And then it was only in 1923 that they discovered this hormone estrogen in the ovaries. And then, um, you know, in the next decade, they found out that estrogen causes mammary cancer in mice. And then there's this quote from, um, you know, a conference that uh, you know, usually this is a conference that all cancer researchers attend. At that point, you know, in 1936, this is how the, the scientific community was thinking about breast cancer. And, you know, uh, this professor said, if one accepts the consideration of adenocarcinoma of the breast as the consequence of the proliferative action of estrogen, one is led to imagine a therapeutic preventive for subjects. It would consist in the suitable use of a hormone antagonistic or excretory to prevent the stagnation of estrogen in the ducts of the breast. So he was one of the clever people who recognized the potential that since estrogen fuels breast tumor growth, that it's also a good way to block tumor growth if there's a way we can block estrogen action. So that kind of really uh, set this stage for the field to uh, look into these you know, synthetic estrogens and anti-estrogens for 
you know, achieving this uh, therapeutic benefit, which was in the 40, uh, 40s and 60s. And it's funny that only after three decades or four decades after discovering the hormone that actually the receptor for estrogen was discovered in 1966. And then shortly after that, they discovered the first molecule, um, which is an anti-estrogen called tamoxifen, uh, which is a non steroidal anti-estrogen. And uh, they showed that this is effective in, uh, in treating breast cancer patients. And then uh, they showed that uh, for oophorectomy to work for you know, metastatic breast cancer to go away by removing the ovaries, this depends on whether the patient expresses the estrogen receptor or not in the tumor. And uh, in 1976, they showed that tamoxifen block, blocks uh, rat memory cancer growth. So, uh, you know, let's look at this a little bit. So in the 1970s, they knew that the ovaries were feeling breast tumor growth and that if you were to remove the ovaries, this would cause a shrinkage in the tumor. And, you know, this was the action of estrogen and the estrogen receptor. So now uh, thinking about this, you know, uh, based on that kind of inspiring quote uh, from that meeting, you know, at that point, how could we what strategies we could think about blocking tumor growth. So there are two sides to this, right? There's the estrogen hormone and there's the estrogen receptor. So not surprisingly, there are a couple of things we can do, which is either at the hormone level or at the uh, receptor level. So we can either block this interaction somehow, or if there's a way, if we could block the body from producing estrogen, that would also be a good effective endocrine therapy. So let's look at those different uh, classes of how to block the action of the estrogen receptor. So these are broken down into two different classes of compounds. One of them is called selective estrogen receptor modulators or CIRMs for short. You might hear this term a lot in, in papers and in medical literature. The other class is called selective estrogen receptor down regulators or CIRDs. So here we're going to kind of modulate the action of the estrogen receptor, whereas here we will physically be down regulating the estrogen receptor. So hence these names. So for the CIRM class, these are compounds that bind the estrogen receptor. So they can be a couple different types. They can be an agonist, which means they bind the receptor and they trigger a response. They can be an antagonist, which means they bind and they block the action by dampening the biological response. And some compounds have mixed agonist antagonist activity, which means in certain tissues, they act as an agonist and in others, it might act as an antagonist. Some examples are tamoxifen and raloxifen. And these were the early classes of compounds that were discovered. And more uh, you know, recently, we also discovered this uh, class of compounds that bind the estrogen receptor. So these are advantageous because these are pure antagonists, meaning in the tissues where they act, they will downregulate the estrogen receptor, they will degrade it, and as a result, you know, those target genes will not be expressed and tumor growth will be decreased. So a good example for that is uh, polystrand, which is a clinically used compound for treating breast cancer patients. So how does this work? Just to put it into context with this cartoon. So different kinds of compounds we talked about. Let's see how they work. Typically, estrogen will go ahead and bind the estrogen receptor. The two of them, as we talked about this, they will go and find their respective elements on the DNA. And then this will trigger a set of genes that are required for fueling the breast tumor growth. In the case of tamoxifen, you will notice that it looks quite similar to the hormone estrogen. So it fits really nice in here. So in a way it competes with the estrogen. It can go and physically occupy the estrogen receptor, thereby preventing estrogen from engaging with the estrogen receptor. So this is one way of blocking you know, estrogen action. And as a result, you don't have gene transcription and you don't have tumor growth. So tamoxifen was really a very effective drug that was discovered, you know, like quite early. And uh, it's been shown to decrease both recurrence of patients, which means once a patient, you know, goes through like surgery, some kind of treatment, what is the chance that their tumor is going to come back? And also it's decreased mortality as well. So I want to show you these kinds of graphs that you may you know, want to get familiar looking at. So these are called Kaplan-Meier or survival curves. So on the uh, y-axis here is kind of the percentage of patients. And on the x-axis here typically is the years uh, where we're monitoring 
a group of patients. You know, at the beginning, all the patients are alive. And in this case, they have no recurrence. Here, they're all alive. And then over time, some events will start happening in these patients. As a result, you know, we will have a decrease in this 100%. So uh, here, uh, you know, the dotted lines actually represent patients that are node negative, which means they don't have um, disease spread to their lymph nodes yet. The dark lines actually are patients which are node positive. So they have a little bit more uh, advanced growth. And not very surprisingly, you can see that the patients with uh, disease disseminated to their nodes, they have, you know, um, so this is a recurrence reduction. So you can see that they have less recurrence reduction compared to these other patients. So what's important to recognize here is that compared to the control patients, as you can see, tamoxifen patients actually have less, uh, less recurrence in both the groups. And this is also true for mortality reduction. So at the beginning, you have all patients alive. And then over time, if patients are treated with tamoxifen, a lot more of them are alive at these 10 uh, point, uh, 10 year point. So this has made tamoxifen the gold standard for treating all ER positive breast cancer for about 30 years. And uh, so this was one of the revolutionizing therapies uh, that worked pretty well. So I mentioned that another approach that we can take is actually blocking the synthesis of estrogen. So I mentioned that uh, in the ovaries, testosterone can be broken down into estri estradiol. So with menopause, you know, the ovaries are gone. So in postmenopausal women, do we still have estrogen? The answer is yes. And we have estrogen because in addition to the ovaries, there are, um, you know, small amounts of estrogen that are produced in other tissues, such as the adrenal gland, you know, and the uh, adipose tissue or the fat tissue surrounding the breast. So, you know, when the major estrogen source ovaries are gone, we still have estrogen produced from specifically from the adipose tissue, um, which is mediated by this enzyme called aromatase. So this is another therapeutic option for us because if we had a compound that could inhibit this aromatase, inhib this aromatase enzyme, then we could eliminate this residual estrogen that is in postmenopausal women who no longer produce estrogen through their ovaries. So luckily, researchers were able to discover such a class of compounds or called aromatase inhibitors, which block the production of estrogen and specifically in postmenopausal women is very effective. So for these aromatase inhibitors, which are clinically used, there are also two classes based on their chemical structure. One class is called non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors and good examples are anastrozole and letrozole and the other class is steroidal inhibitors such as exemestane. And all of them, you know, are aromatase inhibitors, which can block the conversion of androgen to estrogen. And uh, they are quite powerful in postmenopausal women because they can block about 97 to 99% of estrogen synthesis. And this is usually a time where I ask the class why they think that aromatase inhibitors don't work. They would not work very well for premenopausal patients. I don't know if anybody has an answer for that feel free to just unmute, say something, you know, based on what we covered, it could be wrong and that's okay. We can go back and like cover it, but um, okay. I'll just go ahead and, you know, give you like a Friday treat and like give the answer that as we talked about this in premenopausal patient, the ovary is still intact and ovary is such a major source for production of estrogen that, you know, the aromatase function is just a small fraction. So, you know, even if you block that in premenopausal patients, you still have this massive amount of estrogen from the ovary that's going to kind of override the system. So this is why treatment of premenopausal women with aromatase inhibitors is not going to be as effective as treating postmenopausal patients where the ovary is no longer producing estrogens. And now the major estrogen source is aromatase driven uh, conversion of androgen to estrogen. So they are quite effective in blocking uh, synthesis of estrogen in postmenopausal patients for that. So, and actually uh, it was compared uh, whether AIs kind of, how well they do compare to tamoxifen, especially in postmenopausal women. And uh, so this is another kind of graph 
it's graphed a little bit differently now. You know, instead of like dropping from 100, it's showing you the percent of patients with recurrence. So this is increasing over time. So here the blue line is a aromatase inhibitor, an astrazone, and the red line is tamoxifen. So if you compare them at both the five-year time point and at the 10-year time point, you can see that uh, with the use of the aromatase inhibitor, there's a dramatic decrease in the number, like in the percentage of patients that go on to have recurrences. And, you know, these are percentages, but as I mentioned, there's actually so many patients affected with breast cancer. This is actually like a big, uh, big actual numbers. So uh, for this reason, AIs are now the preferred treatment for postmenopausal women with ER positive breast cancer because they work much better, you know, over several clinical trials compared to tamoxifen and they can significantly reduce recurrence and death that is arising from breast cancer. So yes, they are good, yes. I have a question. So just, just to make sure, so um, aromatase activity in the ovaries is like pretty insignificant and, and that's why the, the AIs aren't as effective in premenopausal women? Yeah, there are different classes of aromatases in the ovaries versus you know the adiposal fat. Also in uh, the premenopausal women, there is so much estrogen produced that there is like a feedback mechanism from the pituitary that kind of puts an additional feedback mechanism that uh, can override the system. So this is why, uh, you know, in the postmenopausal patients, aromatase will be a very big component of how much estrogen is synthesized versus uh, in the premenopausal women, there are additional feedback mechanisms that uh, will override that normal regulation. So their aromatase is a lot less important than would be in the case of the postmenopausal patients. Oh, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, AIs, as I mentioned, they are a great class of compounds, but as you know, each class of you know, drugs, they have their pros as well as their cons. So let's compare tamoxifen and AI in terms of their pros and cons. So I mentioned this mixed agonist and antagonist activity for CIRMs such as tamoxifen. So this means that they can block ER in the breast cancer, but they actually activate ER in the bone. So this means that they are mixed agonist antagonist being an agonist in the breast, in the breast versus antagonist, uh, being an antagonist in the breast versus agonist in uh, the bone. So this is good because uh, ER and estrogen is important for bone health. We talked about that. So this can actually serve to prevent osteoporosis in patients. Also, we can use tamoxifen, you know, both in pre and postmenopausal women because it actually binds the estrogen receptor and kind of kicks off uh, you know, estrogen from binding it. So we can use it in both of these uh, patient populations, but there are some cons associated with tamoxifen use. And it goes back to its agonist antagonistic activity because unfortunately it activates the estrogen receptor endometrium. So this increases endometrial uh, cancer risk. Also, it can cause increased risk of uh, blood clotting. Also, there's extensive metabolism in the liver. So this may not be very uh, good for patients. And it creates some menopause-like side effects, such as hot flashes, emotional instability, and depression, because we talked about its effects on you know, the brain health as well. So for the AIs, they don't have this CIRM activity, so there are no negative effects of ER regulation, but also they are more effective than tamoxifen because they don't have this, you know, like this uh, mixed agonist antagonist activity. However, that also comes as a con because now we are losing the benefit to the bone health that we were getting from tamoxifen. And especially in postmenopausal women, this is a major disadvantage because that's the age where, you know, bone starts becoming uh, a lot more fragile. So uh, they're, as we talked about this, they're not very effective in premenopausal women. And this is uh, what I was trying to explain, you know, because there is the pituitary uh, feedback, which overlies the, the, the aromatase inhibitors in premenopausal women. And then compared to tamoxifen, it produces different menopause-like side effects, including uh, muscle, bone, pain, and uh, fracture risk. And uh, these are actually oral compounds that are taken once daily, but patients have to stay on them for a really long time to see benefit because 
as to, uh, you know, breast cancer seems to be able to recur after several years, um, you know, from being treated. And people think that there may be some dormancy mechanisms. So, you know, even if clinically there is no tumor at the time, it's important to keep taking these compounds for a really long time to keep any residual activity in place. Uh, but the good thing is these are these can be taken daily as tablets and patients can take them at home compared to another class of compounds that I talked about, these SERDs, uh, for instance, fulvestrant. Uh, there is actually um, research on orally available SERDs, but for the time being, for patients to get fulvestrant, they get intramuscular shots at the hospital you know, once a month. So this is a very painful procedure for patients. So this is why there's ongoing research in making orally available uh, uh, fulvestrant-like compounds so that patients can just take them as pills versus having to go to the hospital for that. So, you know, this talk was a lot centric on uh, the estrogen receptor. And I just want to let you know that not all breast cancers express the estrogen receptor. I mentioned at the beginning that dependent on IDC versus ILC, you know, 60 to 70 to 90% of all tumors express the estrogen receptor. And in the clinic, uh, the therapy is based on the tumor receptor status. So for a clinician to be able to prescribe any uh, therapy, first, the tumor is stained. So here is like an example of that staining. This typically we call this an immunohistochemistry stain. So this is actually kind of like painting the, you know, using an antibody that recognizes the estrogen receptor. We almost like painting the tissue to understand how much and where the estrogen receptor is being expressed. So depending on the results of this, then the patient will be prescribed the appropriate treatment. And not surprisingly, if the patient is expressing estrogen receptor, you know, they will be given these uh, endocrine therapies that I mentioned. But if not, then they will not be. And you know, if they have expression of this growth factor receptor called HER2, actually there are targeted therapies that target the HER2, such as Herceptin, so they will be prescribed that. And if they're neg triple negative, meaning they don't express the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, or HER2, uh, then they're called triple negative. So these are very aggressive. Not surprisingly, they will not respond to hormone therapy. And instead, typically, they will be treated with um, you know, chemotherapy. But more recently, you might have heard of kind of immunotherapies, whereby uh, patients are given uh, some classes of compounds, which can activate the individual's own immune system to attack the tumor. So this seems to be working pretty well for these aggressive uh, triple negative breast cancers. So as I mentioned, treatment is uh, largely dependent on the receptor status and therefore the prognosis as well. So actually patients with ER positive breast cancer, there's so many agents available for them that we talked about. And then just uh, you know, prognostically, they are much less aggressive and they have good survival compared to the triple negative breast cancer patients that I just talked about with the aggressive subtype. However, even though patients do remarkably well, endocrine therapy does not cure all patients. Uh, we talked about this recurrence, um, uh, recurrence rate graph before that even though a lot of patients do remarkably well, you know, at the 10 year mark, up to 25% of patients have their cancer recur, like within 10 years. This means one out of four patients that are treated, you know, they might end up having a really late term recurrence, you know, facing that, that cancer once more. And in some cases, it may be a lot more aggressive. And sometimes those patients will receive chemotherapy in order to combat that recurrence. Or if they were treated with one class of endocrine therapy, sometimes they can be switched to another class of endocrine therapy, and that might be more effective. And sometimes, you know, they can actually lose dependence on the estrogen receptor as well, either by uh, kind of losing the expression of the estrogen receptor or using some other mechanisms to activate it, which are different than the normal regulation that I talked about. So let's cover a little bit how that occurs. How do breast cancers resist endocrine therapy? So for the action of tamoxifen, there are a couple of potential resistant mechanisms. So this is what we talked about. I'm just trying to drive this home so that at the end of this class, everybody has a clear picture that 
Estrogen acts by binding the estrogen receptor and they bind their respective elements on DNA, turning on target genes to fuel breast tumor growth. And we talked about tamoxifen binding the estrogen receptor, kicking estrogen kind of off the receptor. As a result, no target gene expression and no breast tumor growth. So one potential mechanism of resistance is activation of kinase signaling. So those growth factor receptors like HER2 or the insulin growth factor receptor or epidermal growth factor receptor and others, they may start to be upregulated on the plasma membrane because the cancer is kind of trying to evade this therapy. So it's usually like going through random mutations and some of those tend to be advantageous for the tumor and therefore they will be selected for. So in this case, you may have these growth factor receptors fueling downstream pathways such as the RAS pathway and the PI3 kinase pathway. And now those same genes can be activated by, you know, the action of these pathways without a need for, you know, ER kind of bypassing ER. So this is one mechanism. And sometimes you can have recognition of tamoxifen as an agonist, because I told you about kind of this like dirty effect of CIRMS, that sometimes you have these cofactors that are normally not there, but if they become upregulated, Normally, tamoxifen should be blocking ER from binding the DNA, but you may have these cofactors which bind and change kind of this configuration of this complex in a way that now they allow this complex to go and bind the targets that would normally be activated by estrogen. And then this will also fuel tumor growth. And in the case of AIs, you can also have activation of kinase signaling, so they may be important, but sometimes you have activation without the estrogen. If you remember, we said AIs are important for blocking the synthesis of estrogen, but if a cell finds a way to activate breast tumor growth without needing the estrogen hormone, and it does this by upstream kinase signaling, where sometimes there are modification events, such as phosphorylation events, that would normally only happen with estrogen, but now all of a sudden, without estrogen, ER can be activated, and then it can go and find um, you know, its target genes and fuel breast tumor growth without estrogen. Sometimes you can have alternatively hypersensitivity to estrogen. Typically you need a certain amount of estrogen to be able to activate ER. And in some cases, you know, cancers may select for certain events that allow even the tiny uh, kind of normally not sufficient levels of estrogens to drive this growth. You can also have some alternative estrogens. We talked about some other forms than estradiol. Normally, they're not very um, they're not very potent, but you may have changes in the estrogen receptor, or you may have these coactivator, uh, you know, expression that can now make cells respond to alternative estrogens in the absence of estradiol. You can also have other oncogene-driven pathways, but more importantly. Um, Recent data shows that you may actually have mutations within the estrogen receptor itself, which I think is one of the most kind of um, um, important uh, pieces of uh, data that we got from a recent research on the estrogen receptor. So I think I want to take a couple of minutes to uh, focus on those estrogen receptor mutations. Uh, these mutations were reported uh, 30, 40 years ago, very, very rare in primary untreated ER positive breast cancer, but then people could not really validate them in subsequent studies. And the rate of positivity was like so low, like less than 1% of the patients had this mutation. So nobody thought that these were actually very important until people started uh, having more access to tissue from these metastatic sites. So in the primary tumor, when they sequenced it a long time ago, they did not find these mutations. However, more recently, they started sequencing the estrogen receptor in these metastatic lesions. And then they realized that, you know, depending on the study, 20 to 50% of these patients may have estrogen receptor mutations in their metastatic cancer. And these mutations are not random. Uh, this is kind of a protein structure of the estrogen receptor. You know, there's like these different, like here's the domain for uh, DNA binding domain. Uh, there's like the activation function domain, but there's this very important domain called the ligand binding domain. So this is the part of the protein that is normally responsible for binding to estrogen. So in a way, there are mutations in the physical DNA of these patients where these amino acids are now changed, and this makes the 
estrogen receptor no longer need estrogen to be able to be activated. So this is a very dangerous situation because you know, this is a very tightly regulated system where the ER will not be active without estrogen in normal tissues. However, when these mutations are selected in patients, now, even if you have therapies, uh, because the ER no longer needs estrogen, um, you know, the pathways will be turned on and therefore we have progressive disease in these metastatic uh, patients. And here is just a quick depiction of that. So in wild type tumors, as we talked about, you have estrogen binding to ER, and then they go and bind the, the, the DNA and turn on target genes. In the case of these mutations, and two of them are depicted here, these are the most prevalent mutations. This means that at uh, you know, amino acid position 537, the tyrosine residue is being mutated to a serine. So, and then there's this uh, you know, close by mutation. Uh, you have to the, 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 the G mutation. So as a result, as you can see with this mutation causing a conformational change in the structure of the protein that renders it uh, independent of estradiol. So they can go and bind these genes. And this is quite important because uh, these mutations, they fuel ER without estrogen. And we know that they respond to uh, these classes, different classes of compounds that we covered quite poorly, which means that you need so much more compound to be able to block the mutant ER compared to the wild type ER. And typically this causes endocrine resistance and uh, metastasis in these patients. So uh, there are some remaining questions and challenges, even though, as you see, we have so much uh, knowledge and you know a quite good grip on understanding how estrogen works and how uh, it fuels uh, breast cancer. However, uh, we don't really understand fully the critical events that allow estrogen to drive tumor genesis, because in most cases, this is a long process you know, where uh, additional events have to happen for uh, invasive cancer to form. Also, we need to understand how we can target the estrogen receptor without, the comp without compromising the beneficial effects of estrogen. As I mentioned, these are quite important for you know, the case of, of bone health, and uh, you know, for skin health. So you know, we want to be able to almost find a way to block it in the tumor, but not the rest of the body, which, is, which still remains as an important challenge. Also, I mentioned that these estrogen receptor mutations that confer resistance to targeted therapies. So we need to come up with dramatically different ways. You know, how can we have better compounds that can also be effective in these patients that have these ESR1 mutations in their metastatic tissue? I also talked about invasive lobular carcinoma, which I work on, that compared to IDC, even though they're ER positive, they really have much higher rate of late-term occurrences, uh, which is quite paradoxical compared to IDC. So how can we think of ILC as a, as a special subtype, and how can we come up with treatments that will work for that patient population? And I briefly mentioned that uh, you know, a lot of pharmaceutical companies are investing a lot of uh, money and effort into developing these novel terms and surge that can be a lot more effective, you know, have less side effects that can treat ESR1 mutations, but also there's quite a bit of investment in developing these oral surge whereby patients can take these pills, you know, at home instead of having to go to the hospital to get these intramuscular shots, which are quite painful. And I guess the idea is how can we combine the best aspects of CIRMs and AIs, which individually have their cons and pros, in order to target new pathways and minimize side effects. And then there's always this concept of personalized therapy. You know, some patients may have ER positive tumor, but they may have other mutations in their um, DNA, which makes the endocrine therapy less responsive. So how can we sequence the tumors of these patients and find these putative driver genes. And for those ones where we have some therapies, how can we combine those two different therapies in a way tailoring the therapy specific to each patient? And as I mentioned, a big um, hurdle is overcoming resistance in patients. You know, those patients that are resistant from the get-go versus some patients that are uh, responding to the therapy initially, but say after two years, all of a sudden now they have another tumor or another metastasis. So how can we predict these? Can we 
um, give patients some additional compounds in order to overcome this resistance. And you know, there's a lot of research on this where people are trying to take the tissue from a patient and then put it into a kind of a 3D culture in the lab, which mimics the growth of the patient tumor quite well. These are called organoids and people are testing compounds on them. And then usually the response of the organoid seems to respond pretty well, correspond really well to the patient response. So people are almost trying to expect what kind of resistance there will be and test uh, which compounds can overcome that resistance. And in you know anecdotal cases, giving those to the patients might uh, you know show benefits. So how can we just do that at a more um, kind of streamlined setting in the clinic? That's a bit of a challenge. And then there's this other concept of like stem cells that are also uh, kind of uh, contributing to the resistance. So in addition to normal cells, there are cells called like stem cells that are constantly self-renewing. So those are the cells that are much harder to get rid of with therapies. So even if we eliminate say 98% of all the tumor, there are these persistent cells that are slow proliferating that can kind of escape therapy, such as chemotherapy. And as long as we don't eliminate those cells, uh, you know, the cancer is going to find a way to come back. So that's, that's also an active area of research in breast cancer, as well as other cancer types in order to overcome uh, resistance. So that's all from me on breast cancer and how we treat breast cancer. I know that was a lot of information to cover in one hour, but I tried to you know, provide some schematics. So I'm not sure that I sent the slides to Solomon. I don't think I did, but I can provide them if that would help you know, to review and to you know, like walk away with a solid understanding of breast cancer. And then if you have any questions, either now or later, you, know, you can let me know. So maybe now, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. And if not, there's my email address. I so Nogan, we have, we have a question in the chat. Yes. Jonathan asks, do you think the complexities of breast cancer cell signaling can ever be explained by mathematical or computational methods? Mm, this is an area that I'm not an expert in, but I think a lot of people are really trying to apply that kind of science to that, you know, like for understanding, like people are, um, sequencing tumors and then trying to construct kind of lineages like where not just tumors but like metastases and you know this is something that our lab does as well to try to look at those you know events like I'm sure you guys know about like these truncal mutations versus you know mutations that happen kind of like further downstream to kind of try to understand where this tumor originated maybe what was the first site of metastasis and sometimes you can have like these cross seeding events where initially you have like the the primary cancer kind of fueling the metastases but then you know cells from the metastases can go back and you know be present in the in the primary tumor so i know a lot of people are using mathematical modeling to to do those whether that can fully explain, you know, everything, all the complexity we see, I, I'm not sure, probably not. But that's why we invest in smart young minds like you, you know, to do the research that you guys are doing, you know, to help us understand these things much better. So that is definitely an ongoing and evolving area of, of uh, breast cancer research. And I think, you know, it's very timely. The kind of research you guys are doing is very, very timely for that. Great. Thanks, Nogan. And there's another question from Erica. Why is ILC breast cancer becoming more common? Yeah, I think people think that, uh, number one, the detection methods are becoming much, much better. So I think it was only recently that, you know, there's these cases where a patient was having a mammogram every year. However, like two months after their last mammogram, they have like this massive, uh, you know, breast cancer detected or something. So I think for sure, part of it has to do with our detection method now becoming much better. And then kind of uh, physicians becoming more aware of this different kind of subtype and sending patients for a follow-up MRI or a CT in those cases. But I think also it's becoming, uh, I think with like these environmental estrogens and, you know, hormone replacement therapy, I think those are probably also fueling uh, the 
uh, incidence of ILC more than IDC, because at least with preliminary data from the lab, we know that they respond quite differently to estrogen. Like there are some built-in mechanisms where once there's estrogen in the cell, you know, they do it, like it binds the estrogen receptor, does its job, but then there are kind of feedback mechanisms to make sure that, you know, not too much estrogen receptor is made. So as a result, the estrogen receptor will be downregulated when there's estrogen in the cell. We know that in ILC, this is broken. In that cancer type, there are additional events which have made the estrogen receptor stay there for a lot longer time. So we think that, you know, whatever if environmental, you know, exposure we get from like plastics and other things that may be having uh, more of an incidence rate for, for ILC, in addition to like this hormone replacement therapy that patients are getting that, you know, with the same amount of estrogen you get, you may be having dramatically increased, um, you know, responses for the pathway as well as cancer risk in ILC patients. But for sure, the rates of detection getting better, I think that's also adding to those statistics as well. Excellent. Any other questions? Any, Any other, other questions? questions? Okay, there are no other questions in the chat, but there are a couple of people that said thank you, that you described it. Uh, uh, you made it easy to understand, et cetera, et cetera, and people running off to go meet with their mentors. Oh, good. Well, thanks for enduring, you know, a Friday class on breast cancer. And I hope, you know, that it will help you in your studies and, you know, best of luck with your research and, you know, keep, keep going. <laughs> thanks, Nogan. I appreciate it. Yeah. Take care, guys. Have a nice weekend. And Solomon, should I send you the slides? Is that useful? Yeah, um, if you send me the slides, I'll put them up in the Google Classroom okay. and on the Discord. I'll try to send them as a PowerPoint, so uh, you know the animations will be there. But if the if it's too large, I'll put it on box or something. But I'll also try to send them to you as a PDF. Perfect, okay. not a problem.